welcome to the evidence-based EdTech series, a joint venture between Educate and the EdTech podcast. My name is Rose Luckin and I'm your host today. I'm a professor with an expertise in artificial intelligence and educational technology at UCL's Institute of Education and founder of Educate Ventures Research. Now today we're going to be talking about AI, artificial intelligence in higher education and technology in general of course. EdTech and AI are increasingly around us in our homes, the workplace, lecture halls and classrooms. But whether we're using it to teach others or learning from it ourselves, the question always remains, how do we know it works? So today we're going to be investigating artificial intelligence and educational technology and how far they've penetrated higher education, both in the UK and beyond and ask how higher education is changing with the introductions of systems designed to measure the effectiveness of modes of teaching, such as those used for online learning. I am really excited about the guests who are joining me today in our Zoom studio. We have Julie Greenwood from Arizona State University, Andy Finkelstein from City University in London, and Ant Bagshaw, who works in Australia and New Zealand, and is an advisor for the global education consulting firm LEK. My first question is, what do you think students need from higher education in the 21st century? And how, in your experience, is this provided? And I'm hoping as you answer this question that we can hear about your perspectives on technology, including artificial intelligence, and the way that it's used in the universities where you work or the universities who you work with. And what capacity gets built into the existing models within education to really deliver a unique and comprehensive student experience. So I'm going to start with Julia. Now you've got a senior role at Arizona State University, and that's a university with a great reputation for innovation and using technology to make higher education available to a diverse body of students. Thanks, Rose. Um, As as you know, I have uh, somewhat of a non-traditional administrative position uh, in that as a tenured faculty member, uh, I'm vice dean for educational initiatives, and I work out of Ed Plus. And so Ed Plus is a foundational support and innovation unit that administers ASU online uh, to over 80,000 students. However, in my role, I have this opportunity to support faculty and students across modalities, supporting learning and success at scale uh, to learners from all demographic populations. And, And so scale is a big theme that you'll hear, and that's the ASU is very much committed to scale. I I think, interestingly, I always like to point out that earlier in my career as as a cellular biochemist, I was adamantly opposed uh, to online education. And it really wasn't until I I saw how online access helped my students, and, and then ultimately my kids, and how that was critical for them to be successful in the direction that they wanted to move. And so now I've I've embraced online hybrid education, and I'm a very strong advocate uh, for access across the modalities. And so that's the lead into what students, uh, I think, is most important is access. Uh, And I'm going to quote the ASU charter, and I think you've heard this several times from me, Rose, but my favorite line on this is, uh, we are committed to being measured not by who we exclude, but by who we include and how they succeed. And so that that commitment drew me to ASU. Uh, It translates to expansive use of digital education technologies uh, that increases access to higher education. Uh, Most of our online programs are asynchronous learning experiences. And it really provides flexibility to this wide range of learners that we engage with. Uh, We've got a huge span of ages. We have part-time, we have full-time, we have a global student base. Uh, Many of our students are returning to complete a degree that they previously started, but were unable to finish due to the inflexibilities of, of a traditional university system. And so ASU is committed you know, to providing access, low-cost access, 
partly we do that through, you know, equitable support and development of assistance, you know, employee assistance programs. Um, my favorite is probably our, our Starbucks college achievement plan where employees of Starbucks can get a no cost tuition pathway that we support them on. Uh, and those are those are increasing and, and that model is being used by uh, other universities, certainly across uh, the states. Um, you know, in terms of technology, we, we probably have tested over 200 tools, uh, educational technology tools. We have an accelerator uh, in uh, ASU Enterprise Partners that helps us with that. Uh, I would say we consistently use about 100 technologies, um, but really there's, there's a key 20 technologies that we're using in a significant way for, for uh, thousands upon thousands of students. Uh, you know, that priority is always about uh, leveraging the technology to support the faculty, free up faculty time, right? So faculty aren't doing the mundane task and then they can invest their time in engagements and interactions and building relationships and connections with students in, in an equitable way. That's really interesting. So access, diversity, lots of use of tech tools. Can I just come back and ask that? That I was really interested in those key 20 tech tools. How did you decide which the 20 key tech tools for ASU were out of interest? Well, there, there's your, your base technology, so your learning management system, uh, certainly video editing. So uh, I think Wistia is still our, our, our number one uh, tool that gets used. It does uh, transcription, uh, so that, that's critical for accessibility to our students. And then there's engagement tools that have become, uh, have widespread usage, such as Yellowdig, uh, Inscribe. Uh, we're leveraging Inscribe now for uh, creating community learning uh, approaches for our online students. Uh, we actually have I'll shamelessly plug our, our website, the, the ASU Teach Online website has a really nifty uh, diagram or image of all of the tools, all the different categories, and a description of how they all can and should be used by faculty. And, and so once again, it's, it's providing that information to faculty and helping them not only in the implementation of that technology, but how to integrate it into the curriculum and leverage it in the pedagogy uh, for teaching and learning. That's really interesting. And, and presumably that's based on evidence that you've derived about what works for you and your students at ASU, and then teachers can use that to make those choices. Have I understood that correctly? Some of it is just practical. Canvas allows us to scale. And Canvas gives us data to once again be able to understand how students are yes. learning, seeding, yeah. and testing tools. Uh, certainly, in we're constantly running uh, research studies and piloting tools. We have a dedicated lab, research lab, the Action Lab, uh, to understanding how students are learning uh, within. Yeah. Uh, different modalities and how they're using these technical tools. So I would say yes, and sometimes more for some than others uh, as we're doing our developments. Anthony, I'd love to come to you next. I mean, you've got a long and very impressive history with various councils, institutes, universities, both here and abroad, and now you're president of City University in London. What do you believe students need from higher education and how can technology help? And again, please, can you say a little bit about yourself and City as you answer the question? Uh, so the obvious um, uh, thing to say immediately by, uh, um, it is to start somewhere where uh, the, in the same place that Julie uh, started, um, which is, you know, what do students want from higher education? Well, access. So that's a pretty good starting point for a discussion. Uh, about what students want from higher education. Uh, by background, uh, I'm a computer scientist, um, by background, an engineer. I always say about myself that I'm an engineer who happens to be an academic rather than an academic who happens to be uh, an engineer. I've had a long career in higher education, um, starting my career at 
Imperial College, spending um, a, a good deal of time also at University College London. Um, so like Rose, I know that being a professor at UCL is a pretty good gig. I then spent six years as a chief scientific advisor in the UK government before returning to higher education as a president of City University of London. And yes, it is worthwhile saying something about City because it informs what I'm going to say um, next. So City Strapline is we are um, the University of Business Practice and the Professions. We are a medium uh, to large size institution by UK standards, about 20,000 uh, about 20,000 students. We are part of the Federal University of, uh, of London. And uh, I mean, the first thing to, uh, um, by way of a response to the, um, uh, to the question, is to say there's an extraordinary diversity of what things students want from higher, uh, want from higher education. Uh, you know, in the UK, 54% of the relevant age range are now uh, engaged with higher education. So their needs, backgrounds, expectations for higher education are extraordinarily diverse. And the institutions that, um, uh, that provide it are very diverse. Cities focus on being a technical and professional institution is very different from even other colleges, you know, uh, um, an intensive college for the so, uh, elite in research institution for the social sciences, like, for example, the London School of Economics. So there's just an extraordinary diversity. And it's really been fascinating that how different the needs and expectations of students have been how differently they have responded to the steps that have been taken in online edu uh, in online education. So we've seen in the um, in the UK the first steps in online education that during the pandemic students in the traditional campus based universities reacted very uh, reacted very poorly. This wasn't their expectation of what our higher education experience should be. Students in other settings, some of my students. For example, commuter students in a major metropolitan institution managing complex lives and with different needs, expectations, and goals for their uh, uh, for their study reacted very uh, very differently. And so that informs my uh, my view about about technology and uh, and higher education. So we, are, I should say now about city, and we are in a very different place from ASU, which makes this discussion so stimulating. Uh, um, uh, so stimulating. If I said we were behind the curve, that would imply that we were out of step with most of the other institutions of our size and shape in the UK, and I don't think that's uh, that's the that's the case. But the distance that is opening up between where we are and the potentialities of the technology are enormous and growing day to day. So a moment's pause while I say then my sort of my perspective. I believe higher education is being radically disrupted. And I believe that most people in higher education have very little grasp on the scale, pace and nature of that, um, of that disruption. And I expect in the actually short to medium term that um, uh, we will see the major disruptive consequences. I would hope my institution will be a disruptor, not amongst the disrupted, but that would require enormous steps. For me, my major challenges lie in getting the underlying uh, uh, data substrate right to enable the sort of education uh, we require. So in order to really make the difference, it's going to be driven by um, by curriculum models, by a whole range of other things, and by our ability to record data about our students, um, which currently we are not able 
um, we are not able to. It doesn't mean we can't do point experimentation. We absolutely can and have done or on occasion successfully. I love the idea of uh, you as a disruptor. Um, and I, I think your point about this, this nuance on the behind the curve is really interesting because you're not in comparison to other institutions in the UK, but you are in terms of where you want to be and the potentiality. I, I, I can see that. I also think what you're reflecting about getting those data, that structure, sorry, right, is really interesting. And I just want to come back and ask, do you think the fact that you are an engineer, a computer scientist in academia means that perhaps you're in a a slightly special position for, for, for taking this work forward? Yeah, possibly for good and for bad. Uh, uh, there's sometimes a slight danger of being a technologist in these in these settings because you don't take always uh, you're not always able to place yourself in the feet of, uh, of others, and you are overly interested in the technology, which itself is a danger. The thing you you say about behind the curve, the the thing is that exponentials, which you know exponential technological change has some very particular characteristics. It gets away from you very quickly. If you act linearly in response to a to an exponential technological technology that's changing at an exponential uh, rate, you fall behind very, very quickly. And that's, I think, where I feel many universities are at the moment. Interesting, a very interesting what you're saying about the fact that you think there is going to be this major disruption. And I'd love to come to you now because obviously you have an Antipodean perspective on this, although I know you've also worked in the UK, so you have experience all over the place. And and, and you're a consultant, so you're advising organisations. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself and about the firm that you work for and then about what you think um, in terms of what we need to provide in higher education and, and the impact of AI and, and technology in general. Thanks, Rose. Um, so I work for LEK Consulting and people come to us to solve complex problems. So the the situation that Anthony's just described there, which is the sector is being disrupted. That's complex. It's challenging. There are some answers that will come from within an institution. There are some that need to come from uh, from out with the institution. And that complexity can be scary. It can be exciting for, for leaders in institutions. And the conversations I have with, uh, with university leaders, particularly, there is so much excitement about the potential of technology, of AI, both for in learning and teaching, also on research and enterprise, and, and in how you run an institution efficiently um, and, and doing you know, the most good for, for students or the wider community. And the real challenge and where, where we would add value in the system, where we see we would add value, is in translating that ambition into practice. Because we see institutions at a, that whole scale of maturity. And, and I think, you know, as, as you've reflected, at City, actually, you're probably on par with the sector in the UK, behind where you might want to be. But but actually, what you've described is pretty standard. Uh, and we also know that ASU is absolutely at the, at the leading edge of um, of what's possible, but not everyone can or should be ASU. Not least, not every institution is going to achieve the scale that ASU has achieved in its in its online provision. So, so where we come in is to work with senior leaders in institutions to say, well, okay, you understand that the sector is being disrupted. You're thinking about what what, what your flavour of of the future will be in the context of your own institutional mission, your location, your history, and so on. And we say, well, where should you invest? How should you invest? What's the right risk profile for you? So so when it comes to, say, testing new technologies, well, actually, how do do you want to be a, a follower and 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 take those uh, that the, the, the great people at ASU have, have tested and they're, they're 200 examples and, and you say, well, look, if it's good enough for them or, or, or are we going to do something else? And, and I think that the challenge that that Anthony described around data and the sort of underpinning systems is is absolutely there across institutions, but I'd add a another lens to it, which is I actually think a lot of the 
the tech and, and the answers, many, many of them exist. However, there is a big cultural challenge for the implementation of new technologies within, within the universities that we work with. So the data may be there, but there may be a lack of trust between parts of the institution about sharing the data. There may be an absence of protocols. There may be a, a lack of confidence or, or a, perhaps even that I know a lot of your work, Rose, is on the, the ethical settings around, around AI. There may be a lack of a settled position on how the institution should use data for any sort of intervention, say, on the student welfare uh, point or, or, or in learning. So, so that's where we come in, and and where where we I say where we add value is is helping institutions to tease through that problem, to to evaluate where and how they should make investments, and and so they can make considered decisions um, that are sort of right for the institutional health. But we also bring a global lens. So I've got colleagues working all around the world. So my experience, particularly in the UK and Australia, um, but I've also recently been working in the Middle East, in uh, in Southeast Asia. Um, I have colleagues based in in Africa in the subcontinent and, and working extensively in the Amer- in the Americas so so that's where we also just are able to to share that expertise from across the world that's really important isn't it being able to give that global perspective and share expertise I, I'm fascinated by this something you said about um the challenge the cultural challenge and trust and something that I've because of work I've done in the financial services sector constantly conversations about risk appetite you know and 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 actually higher education can be seen as being perhaps not having a great risk appetite where do you think that is at the moment and and how much does that impact on the way that the technologies and things like ai can be embraced by the sector i think it's a hugely important and and under discussed topic in the sector in general, the institutions uh, that we work with, which are, you know, typically sort of long established universities, sort of capital U universities in the in the sort of public or quasi public uh, part of the sector, tend to be uh, more risk averse. And, and this idea that we can only implement that which is already proven. So, you know, show me the case study, show me, show me how it's yeah. already done. And I, I completely understand where that that comes from. Not least, if the new AI timetabling system falls over, actually that is a very serious problem, and yeah. you know thousands of people will be affected. There'll be lots of embarrassment all around. It will it will be seriously problematic. Uh, so so I understand that. However, if if we think about the future capabilities needed in every institution, I think it is the ability to test, to, to create the sandboxes in which you can um, trial something in a part of the institution to, to learn and, and shift the culture to say, no, 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 we would like to learn. And we would also be honest about where things have not, um, not gone as, as, as planned or, you know, as per the business case. Um, but I think there's many institutions sort of still driven by the need for certainty. This episode is brought to you by Chegg's Centre for Digital Learning, where faculty, administrators, policymakers and students can find useful information to help them navigate the fast-changing world of higher education in the digital age. Chegg's Centre for Digital Learning seeks to foster student and educator success by elevating original research, providing resources and convening conversations to support teaching excellence and meeting the evolving needs of the modern student. Learn more at www.cheg.com forward slash about forward slash Centre for Digital Learning and follow them on Twitter, LinkedIn and Facebook and you'll be able to find that link in the notes to this podcast. And I can see Anthony you'd like to come in. It's on the risk of observation. So I've reached a slightly different point, which is that, which is the balance of the risk of not doing anything against the technological risk. Given my sense of the scale, immediacy and transformative possibilities of the emerging technologies, actually timetabling systems, failing to timetable efficiently or or other things, maybe the lesser uh, uh, those operational risks 
maybe the lesser risk, um, uh, the lesser risks for the institution. And I mean, I hear what you say absolutely about uh, about cultural change, but I also wonder whether or not we have passed the mark when a gradualist approach to cultural change is necessary and when other mechanisms uh, might be appropriate. And that may mean simply thinning out and building outside the walls and other more radical and disruptive choices because a, a more gentle and ordered approach may no longer be fast enough for, for where we need to be. Really interesting in terms of thinking about the tension between future-proofing and ensuring that the student experience remains something coherent and attractive. And, and often those things can be very difficult. Also bringing in a workforce who have often been working in a particular way for many, many years. And so you've got lots of different tensions there. And yet you do, I think, need to be radical. I completely see your point, Anthony, and, and the time for that more gradual, gentle approach. Yeah maybe has passed and we have to recognize that. And, and I want to come back to Julie on that because you are at the university that I think would not be seen as, as having a low risk appetite um, and, and does recognize the need for that, that more radical change. What are your feelings on this matter? I'm going to introduce a little bit of antidotal evidence. Um, so part of our mission is to support other universities in advancing technology for learning and online education. And that's something we're very committed to. And so pre-pandemic, I would say we probably had about 170 visitors from around the world that would come to ASU, come to Ed Plus, and we would show them, here's, here's what we're doing, here's the direction we're moving, come join us in, in this movement. And I would say a large majority of the time, those institutions said, no, thank you. That's not how we want to do it. Boy, this is fascinating. It would never happen at, at our institution. Uh, and a lot of that was back to that the cultural uh, change that would be required to do that. Uh, now, if we fast forward to uh, post-pandemic, uh, I think institutions are coming to us and, and they're saying, help us. We know that we have to do this. Uh, what can you do to support us in moving that forward? Can you partner with us? I think a big part of that is, you know, if we're, you look at the demographics in the states, enrollments are, are going down. Uh, so once again, that gets back to the financial uh, pressures and, and that, that risk of doing nothing versus uh, the risk of trying to do something that's uh, radically different. It, it, they have to do something. Yeah. Uh, there's a responsibility to do something or we're seeing a lot of institutions closing down or merging. And, and so once again, there's kind of this, it's an exciting time. And, and I'll, Rose, I can't wait to get to the AI part because uh, <laughs> I have never been so excited, uh, at least in my administrative career, uh, than I have this last month. Uh, with all that has come out with with open AI. I, I think I remember maybe back in the day when I was in the lab when CRISPR came out that allowed us to do more. Oh, yes. <laughs> to the DNA. That was so exciting. Everyone was talking about it. I, I feel like we're back uh, doing that again across higher ed. I get so many emails on this. There's so many articles. Uh, we, you know, there there was that initial fear I think we're, at least I'm over it. I think a lot of my colleagues are over it. We're like, let's embrace this. How can we do things differently? It is going to be this exciting disruptor. And I'm really looking forward to it. And I'd love to hear, you know, the different perspectives uh, from my colleagues. I'm absolutely going to get right onto that. Um, but I just want to pick up on something that I think is, is poignant to the points that you've been making first. And that is that there was a little um, piece of news that came out this week. It's very UK centric. Uh, but I thought it was very interesting that um, in the UK, 
the BBC did a piece of research using freedom of information requests with 50 of the 160 universities in the UK and discovered that the number of hybrid courses had increased sixfold since between before the pandemic and after the pandemic, which kind of speaks a little bit to why some of the universities who were saying, no, thank you before might say yes now, because I imagine the situation won't be that dissimilar in the US. I could be wrong, but it seems to me there has been this big shift. But something that struck me about this piece of research was the fact that university bosses were saying, it's always been part of our long-term planning. And I thought, interesting. (laughs) And this is about hybrid courses. But students thinking about the access point said they really liked the flexibility, which is where you started, Julie, you know, with flexibility and access. And Anthony picked up on access. But what I thought really struck me was they also felt that it was a bit like a glorified streaming service. And now that could be a comment as to the quality of those hybrid courses, but it might also be part of that disruption in the sector where, you know, are we moving to very different models of of higher education where you do have this this sort of more of a streaming service uh, kind of model? I don't know. I'm not saying we would, but I think it was, I was just very struck by that piece of research. Now I'm going to come to Ant because I know you want to make a point, but then I am absolutely going to come back to the point that, that Julie has taken us to about AI uh, as the exciting disruptor. Not sure everybody in the sector would agree with that. I do, but I'm not sure everybody would. But and- Not to take us away from the exciting bit, but, uh, but perhaps to connect uh, the points that have just been made there, which is, so I think there are people in institutions coming to the, that realisation that Anthony talked about, about the, 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 the need for change and the more radical change. There's still some education that's required, particularly of boards and councils and 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 colleagues. But but I think there is that realization, and as as Judy points out, that there is greater interest. There's also, I think, increasing choice on the part of institutions. Mm. So I think to to that to the to the survey of what of of the the, the hybrid courses. There is going to be huge variety in what hybrid means. So Julie talked about her asynchronous programs. That that that's one one model of uh, of online delivery, you know, or one part, one one component. Now, there's asynchronous, there's synchronous. You can do intensives. You can you can hybridity, and and I think we haven't yet settled on on the the sort of taxonomy of of, of programs. So. So I think that's the, for me, the most exciting bit is how do we capture that recognition of the need for change, understand that there are some examples of what we've, of, of what can be done, particularly in online delivery, online and, and hybrid and blended and however, the, however we want to describe it, but also recognize it's not about here's a, a cookie cutter approach to how every institution should take it forward. Absolutely. That gives me a great riff back to Anthony to say, right, Anthony, excitement, AI, where do you stand on this? You know, what's this mean for future proofing your university, for student experience? There may be a moment, and maybe this is the moment, to take a momentary, to take a step back. And the step back is to look at the larger context of higher education globally. And what we are seeing is a massive expansion of higher, uh, uh, of higher education globally as economies drive towards a skill base, as you know, increasing um, wealth and welfare uh, allows more people educational educational opportunities. The universities of yesterday are not the universities of the future uh, because we must respond to this massification of higher education and the diversity, the scale, the massification. All of these play into the questions about technology in, in higher education. So it is not simply that that there is a technology driver, but that there are a series of other contextual drivers which we need to be strongly aware aware of, which will shape the way technology emerges in this this sector. So, uh, I mean, I absolutely share Julie's excitement. And, you know, I'm I'm, I'm a techie, and I've spent my entire career doing techie stuff, and uh, more or less. And every so often you see something, it makes you take a step back. And I've been aware of these technologies and their potential 
for a very long uh, for a very long time and then like everybody and their granny i had a play with chat gpt and you go wow this actually really you, you suddenly have that moment where you go okay i now i so i really get i can see the difference it reminded me i was um um uh, um, I was in Boston, actually, was at MIT, um, uh, when somebody showed me the first thing of Google and the accuracy of this. I'd been using meta search engines um, uh, before before that, and you just go, okay, I see the game has changed. You have that moment where you can see the game. As you, you know it's not the end point. You know that's not where it is, but you see the game, uh, that the game has changed. These are vastly important technologies, and um, the speed of improvement with the accumulation of data is enormous. And their their possibilities for you know, their educative, their transformative possibilities are enormous. I actually am pretty bullish. I think that I am less of the you know. I recognise that there are risks associated with these things, but just think constantly about the wonderful things that we could be like and this is i mean it repeats in essence um with a different accent what julie's just been saying i i love the bullishness and i I love the excitement and i'm with you absolutely anthony thank you and and just as a, a very brief aside it won't surprise you to find that of course Prior to this episode, I did ask uh, ChatGPT how AI would impact on higher education because I thought it would be quite interesting to see what ChatGPT had to say about this. And I can tell you that it said AI has the potential to impact higher education in a number of ways. Some possible impacts include personalized learning. AI can be used to create personalized learning experience for students by adapting content and pacing the feedback to their individual needs and abilities. I think I might have said that many times in the past. Automation of administrative tasks. AI can be used to automate tasks such as grading, course scheduling, and student advising, freeing up instructors and staff to focus on other aspects of education. Improve student engagement. AI-powered chatbots and virtual assistants can help students stay engaged and on track in their studies to provide quick answers to questions and personalized feedback on their progress. Access to educational resources. Assessing student performance. And on it goes. It's important to note that these are possible impacts and not guaranteed outcomes. It all depends on the usage and implementation of AI in education. But I thought, it's not bad, is it? You know, and I didn't go back and do it again. It would have given me a slightly nuanced answer if I'd gone back again. It's a starting point. We could criticize it, but it's interesting, isn't it? And I think it is exciting. With these things is that uh, precisely as you as you say, I could have said that one of the things about chat GPT is you may well actually have done so. Yes. <laughs> what I find really interesting, slightly frustrating, but but like you, I'm very positive. I'm very bullish. I'm an optimist. But I do remember saying at least 10 years ago, we do need to change the essay as a mode of assessment. AI is coming. We need to do this and kind of chat GPT 10 years later. And hey, everybody now is going, wow, (laughs) we need to think about this. So I think it's interesting, but huge possibilities. Julie, you started us off on this. uh, Let's talk about the exciting AI stuff. Uh, What's your perspective on technologies like chat gpt it doesn't have to be just that or just generative ai but ai in general where do you see the sweet spot that does make sure that we continue to improve the student experience and future proof our universities at a time when there are huge challenges to them as anthony's laid out you know there's not just a technical imperative that there's lots going on in the world well, first, I want to acknowledge, I mean, we are already using AI in so many different places. And in many cases, I think the products we're using, people don't realize it has an AI component to it. So, it, I mean, it's already happening there. Uh, certainly, the GTP chat, uh, I did the same playing around everyone else did. It, it's the one that first caused that fear reaction but then I, I'm, I'm part of a committee with just this outstanding group of faculty uh, who work in English composition. And all of a sudden there was like this light bulb went off from, we can stop assessing about a 
product and talk about teaching the process and helping equalize across uh, these different student demographics where, you know, certain student populations aren't succeeding in these 30-year-old techniques that we've been using uh, for learning and experience. And so once again, th that to me was just the most exciting thing that I've seen. And so how, how are we going to do this? And then, like you said, Rose, you start looking around, these products already exist. Uh, these companies were looking for a way to get in. I found out we've already started uh, doing some piloting. Uh, so that gets me even more excited. And I, I, I think ultimately, if we don't embrace it and we try to fight it, we're going to lose. Uh, students need students will use it to write their essays if we don't change the way that we're teaching. And the truth is, in industry, I, I just recently learned Amazon. So I, I use Amazon. Um, all of their, apparently, many of their descriptions, product descriptions, were generated by AI. Uh, I just recently learned in journalism, many of the articles I'm reading every day were initially drafted by AI. Uh, I had no idea how many different uses already exist. Uh, I think we need we as faculty need to learn more about how it's being used in the workforce. And then once again, support our students so that they're going out and that they're AI ready. They have integrity in its use. They know how to leverage it in a way not to cheat, but to enhance the quality of learning and enhance the quality of their impact on our society. So yeah, I'm, I'm super psyched to see how this evolves over time. And I think we, we can do this in, in a very meaningful way. I love that positivity and I couldn't agree more. And I think the possibilities of the way that human and artificial intelligence can work together that these tools bring are really interesting. But you also raise another very important point there about preparing young people for the world of the future. You know, there will be new jobs that are around perhaps how to best use these tools. You know, how do you write the best questions to get GPT to give you the best answer? You know, how do you use the image generation systems? How do you describe what you want in a way that gets the best answer? I want to ask Ant, as a consultant going around to lots of different universities, are you getting excitement or are you getting trepidation um, over things like ChatGPT highlighting the way that AI is here? It, it, it's going to change education. We can't stop it. <laughs> I think it's both. I think it's absolutely at the same time, both that fear response and that excitement response. And I think uh, I, like many people, you know, was astonished at the, particularly at the quality of the language that came back and the, and the speed with which, um, which, which the system works. And it just, it, you know, it is just an astonishing development in the technology and the, and the, and the, and the sort of the way you access it. But I actually think it'll prompt a really important conversation. Um, which hopefully will bring those the excitement and the, the fear camps together, which is how do you regulate, and I don't mean that in a sort of strict way, but it, it sort of it, it creates an environment in which you've got technologies provided by the institution recognizing the range of technologies available to students. So we also know those extremely popular study advice slash cheating services that some students access already. Some of that AI driven, some of that, uh, you know, human, um, offshore and so on. So there is, I think, a really important prompt to that, to that conversation. Not least it has, I think, existential threats to, to academic integrity and the, the security of, of academic awards, but it also has a huge impact on, on the access and equity piece, which is that there are some students who are accessing those services, say, say they're doing so uh, not to cheat, but to enrich their learning experience, and, and they're paying for that. And, and you've got other people who are without access to it. So I, what I hope we'll get is a, is a really mature conversation about all the sorts of services that, but starting with the student, you know, what do they need? What are they making use of? And then understanding how that reconciles with the, with the institution. But I think 
often the conversation is, no, no, we we as the institution have defined these tools, these are the ones that you'll use, yeah. these are our methods of assessment and so on. Um, take it or leave it. And now that's going to have to change, isn't it? I, I think I think it has to, um, and I think that's a really positive one. And, and I yeah. think to your point, you know, we've been talking about authentic assessment for decades, and <laughs> perhaps this is the time where we can we can move on. Thanks, Ant. Anthony, back to you. Yes, I mean, I, I mean, I agree very much with uh, uh, with Ant's observation. Though I do worry we might spiral down into a discussion of ethics and risks and dis dragged ourselves from the major job of yielding the benefit for our students yeah. from the potential of these technologies and there have been a, a range of places where i've seen that um uh where i've seen that happen and yes, that happened uh, has happened quite a lot in GovTech, where concerns over the ethics of um of some of the technologies have actually caused un have actually resulted in unethical consequences because we haven't been able to yield the benefits for people from the technologies which are available, uh, uh, which are available. So we're going to have to find a way of getting it right. Initially, I was about to make an observation about you know new types of skills that these uh, technologies are are likely to require of our students, including the ability to subtly de- to to look at the deep and subtle bugs that emerge from some of yes. these things which are much more difficult to diagnose so it will require a new set of critical skills in the way that for example uh, information retrieval tools required a different set of skills and critical perspectives from our students my last observation is really that is a slight worry and it be interesting to hear other perspectives on this about one of the problems is that relative to other sectors, higher education is small and quite fragmented. Mm. Relative to the large commercial se- uh, um, uh, sectors, and whether we are going to assemb- be able to assemble the weight of, uh, of market and of investment that's necessary to make quite sure that we actually have a thriving commercial and progressive commercial ecosystem in our in our area, you can see a whole range of areas where actually uh, universities have been very ill served by digital technologies because yes, uh, because of the structure of the market. So I think there are some sort of larger commercial questions I'm, I'm, I'm sort of only hazily gra- grasping after, which will be important and interesting. I'm sure you're right about that, and it'll be interesting to see how that unfolds. I also think your point about your worry about spiraling down into a discussion of ethics and risk is a really important point. I know that I was very fortunate to co-found the Institute for Ethical Artificial Intelligence and Education a few years ago um, with Anthony Selden, then uh, um, Vice Chancellor at the University of Buckingham and Priya Lakhani, an entrepreneur running an AI company. Um, and we had lots of fabulous advisors helping us. And one of the things that we felt very strongly was that it would be unethical to prevent students from benefiting from the potential that AI brings. So part of the challenge is to make sure that we do as much as we possibly can to reduce the risk so that they can get the benefits. And, and what you're saying about the danger of the, you know spiraling into discussions that can be quite damaging and and not help us get those benefits is a real risk. I think it's an important risk to recognise. I I really do. Um, Sadly, we are almost out of time. And I I am really sad about it because it's been a fantastic discussion. But I do want to come to each of you in turn to to give you the opportunity to make a final key point that you would like to make. And it can be any part of this conversation that you want to, you know, come back on it can be about excitement disruption being radical you know what you would like to come back on and I'm going to start with Ant and then go to Julie and then come back to Anthony before we wrap up so over to you Ant what's your final takeaway point you'd like the listeners to have well I'll pick up a thread that I've I've spoken about yeah so far which is about culture and organizational capability and how particularly leaders in universities um, set themselves up for for success and I'm going to specifically pinpoint, I think, the 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 commercial point that, that Anthony just spoke to, um, which is I would love to see institutions taking a more 
on, on a more systematic basis, a rigorous commercial approach to thinking about the technology investment and thinking about that not just from that which they are going to buy, that which they are going to build or co-own, invest in, work with others, getting the scale by by collaborating with other institutions, but really pinpointing that return on investment side. I think it is absolutely essential in the current and future financial conditions of institutions. But I would love to see a more entrepreneurial, sort of financially mm. entrepreneurial approach, which also captures some of the benefits and not, not assuming that all of the 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 testing the ip and that which is generated within universities that all of that financial benefit is captured outside the institution interesting really interesting point and and as a very entrepreneurial academic I, I, it is music to my ears so thank you that 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 is fascinating julie what would your your last takeaway one you would like us to have be please so when i look at higher ed at a, at a global scale uh, the need uh, for access to higher education is going to go from, I think we're probably 240 million right now. That's going to go up to as high as 600 million by 2040. The only way we're going to be able to provide access at that scale is by leveraging digital and online education. And the the individuals who need that access is going to become absolutely critical for them in, in terms of livelihood and, and health span for those individuals in their lives. So once again, I, I think we have to take that on and lead this moving forward. I think AI is already helping us to do that. Uh, it is only going to help us further in doing that. But coming coming back to the you know the points of both Anthony and Ant, who's driving that? Right now, it is being driven by industry, and right now we are more or less. I feel like we're at their will in terms of how this is moving forward. So I think we do have to come together and find a way so that we can be part of that conversation and become the drivers to provide that access. And, and ultimately eliminate the social disparities at a global scale. Really interesting. Thanks, Julie. Brilliant stuff. And Anthony, a final word from you. Well, more than one word, obviously. <laughs> I mean, the first thing to say is um, uh, you know, I, I really um, am, uh, agree with the observations that have just been made. You know, and Anne's observation about, you know, about how we structure investment, because you know, given my earlier observation or observations, I and I think most institutions, we are two orders of magnitude uh, away from the sort of investments, maybe three from the sort of levels of investment um, uh, that are that are going to be required to address um, uh, to address this. I'll stop um, with an anecdote. I remember I went many years ago to a, a seminar at the Institution of Engineering and Technology in the heart of London. Somebody presented what then called um, colloquially the MIT teething rings. I can't remember the exact detail of them. The MIT teething rings were a, a sort, of, sort of interlocking rings that showed um, uh, television, telecommunications, uh, music, and and computers, and it was it was was making the argument for digital convergence. And I remember my friend and I looking at, yeah, you know, okay, of course, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, and then what did we do about it, you know? And then, you know, 15, 20 years, in 25 years, I'd look where we are with that convergence, an ever-present fact in our, um, uh, in, in our lives. Well, what the hell was I doing? I was giving some advice to Kodak, I remember Kodak, the film company. and. Um, I was talking to a, a, one of the senior people in their research labs, and he said, and I, he said to me, you know, I knew about digital photography before everybody knew about digital photography. You know, we were very early in in understanding digital. So I knew all about imaging and all about the imaging technologies. And then, and then my mother bought a digital camera. And I just do not know what I was doing in between those two. 
uh, uh, those two moments when I knew it, and then my mind went and bought a digital cam, uh, 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 a digital camera. I do not want to be in the same um, uh, in that same uh, uh, in that same position. I really could be. Brilliant way of putting it, Anthony. Thank you so much. It's lovely to finish on such a a nice anecdote. Uh, Really great and fascinating. It's been wonderful to talk to you all. I love the positivity. Uh, I love the fact that you're embracing um, the change, driving for access and diversity, uh, but also recognizing there's some pretty big challenges out there um, and that we need to embrace it now <laughs> and get started as soon as we we can. And, and uh, yeah, let's wish everybody luck with that for sure. So I very much appreciate you um, coming on today's episode and making these great contributions. I know listeners will very much enjoy it. I hope wherever you're listening, you found our discussion informative and practical, and you've got something to use or share with your teams in the coming days. This episode has been brought to you by Chegg's Centre for Digital Learning, where faculty, administrators, policymakers and students can find useful information to help them navigate the fast changing world of higher education in the digital age. Chegg's Centre for Digital Learning seeks to foster student and educator success by elevating original research, providing resources and convening conversations to support teaching excellence and meeting the evolving needs of the modern student. Learn more at www.chegg.com forward slash about forward slash Centre for Digital Learning. Tune in for our forthcoming episodes in the series, uh, which will include two complementary investigations into diversity, ethics and inclusion. So we certainly, I hope, whetted people's appetites on, on that subject today. And as always, we don't just look at the UK, we're always looking beyond as well. 